so I'm not going to push it too much further, but I've worked it out because I'm pretty good at maths. Ian, hi, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Richard? Yeah, very well, very well, thank you. Um, just got an extra layer on today, just feeling a bit of a chill, but uh, you're looking quite comfortable then. Oh, yes, yeah. I expect uh, to surprise you to know that uh, Lancaster's reasonably warm, sunny today, so uh, make the most of it. Absolutely. Well, you're on the, you're on the, the edge of the Lake District, aren't you? So <clears throat> you... Exactly. Yeah. Beautiful part of the world. And we might get to that, I suspect. <clears throat> but obviously, this is, um, you're my first victim um, on this. Uh, latest <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see how, how, if this is a mini series or a full series. But um, essentially, what I wanted to do was, was really just talk to people about going full time in property. And um, I'm kind of, you know, setting this up, if you like, as ordinary people. So, it, 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 you know, it's people in my community, in my network, who I know, and I want to come at this from a couple of different angles. So I want to come at it, you know, at an angle of people who have already done it. And um, obviously that's in your case, you've gone full time with property and, you know, perhaps talk us through what you did, how you did it, what you learned, all of that uh, good stuff. And then I think I'm probably just going to balance things out with perhaps people who are starting out now. Um, and just and just bring them in as well, just to get this sort of different perspective um, along the way. So um, obviously we're starting out with somebody who's done it, and congratulations, going full time with property. Thanks. But, yeah, uh, but why don't you just maybe let's just maybe go through a bit of a, a timeline and a story, and should we just start with you know a little bit about you and your background, and certainly before property came along you don't have to tell me your birth you know sign or anything but um you know, just just kind of in the build up in, you know just so people understand a little bit about you and, and can kind of picture you in their own mind's eye if you like would that be okay yeah sure yeah yeah so i worked for 30 years in the uh computer industry um started as a programmer and um, um basically carried on being a programmer but got called a consultant more towards the end so uh used to travel around a lot, uh, to, uh, uh, mostly around Europe, but also a little bit further afield. Um, and um, that, was, uh, that was great fun to start with. <laughs> but um, I got to the point where I wasn't uh, really uh, uh, enjoying it so much. And I think the, uh, the company culture changed and so on. So uh, it became uh, uh, not, not the greatest place to work, shall we say. So, uh, it's, uh, as I was thinking about this earlier, I used to um, walk into uh, one of the offices and they uh, had this sort of corridor where you had to walk into the open plan office space and they had a, um, a series of posters on the wall. And uh, this company, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of companies have mission statements, for example. Um, but this company had a um, mission statement, it had the value statement, uh, and it had vision statements so uh, we really went for it anyway these posters had all these value values along the along the wall and um there were all these pictures of these sort of happy smiling faces and they were perfectly um diversity um audited so yes exactly that's right so there's exactly the right number of uh you know gender um ethnicity and all the rest of it on these pictures and they were so clearly actors and not people who actually worked in the company. And um, they all just had words, you know, the different values. And by the time you got along to the, to the latest one of these pictures, uh, at the bottom, big letters, it said, authenticity. And I really remember walking, walking past there one day and thinking, you know what, if you've got to fake authenticity, then I think probably at some point, me and this company are gonna part company, you know, so. Um, so I started thinking about how I would, how I would get out and uh, how I would be my own boss, you know. So uh, that, uh, that was certainly one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the driving forces behind it. But there were lots of things going on as well. Um, it sort of dawned on me from um, maybe a couple of years before that that uh, uh, property had a lot of advantages over other kinds of investments, you know, had this leverage which uh you know up until that point i just thought that was 
name for a baby hair, but it turns out there's actually this really powerful thing, which is, uh, you know, you, the, the classic example of, you know, you, you buy a hundred thousand pound property, put 25,000 of your own money in, and then after five years of 5% growth, it's worth 125 and you've just doubled your money by using other people's money. So that's a brilliant, uh, uh, tool available to you which you don't have mm. in most other asset classes mm -hmm. so uh there's a few little things like this and a few little clues along the way and uh, i uh, decided that i wanted some income to live off not necessarily replace my income right. which i think would have been a bigger ask but i think have enough money to cover my expenses mm. and um it's like a security so, almost Exactly. That's right. Safety yeah. Safety nets, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I think there was a sort of a you know I don't like using buzzwords so much like mindset, but there was a bit of a mindset change gradually over time. You know, and I started to realise that uh, if you've got a job, you know, it's a single point of failure. You've got one organisation paying you every month, whereas if you've got multiple properties, um, you've got lots of people writing checks to you every month. So if one of them dips out, it's not so much of a problem. Yeah. Um, so I went for this strategy of income, which really boiled down to doing um, HMOs, the multi uh, So that was the uh, that was what I sort of settled on uh, as an approach. So I did a bit of um, background research and reading and. Um, I went into it, but I think uh, it's it's a completely different thing to do it as it is to learn about it and to read about it. So uh, yeah. I think I've probably learned most of my lessons at that point. Oh yeah, well we, there's always a price to pay for our learning, and uh, <laughs> some of it is experience, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Perhaps before we get into the strategy and what you did, just um, if you don't mind. Um, uh, revealing this personal information but what sort of age might you have been looking at uh, making that transition this gradual mindset change and, and a step you know out of one income source before your full-time job and perhaps starting to consider alternatives like with property what sort of age were you at that point well uh, it's a good point actually because uh, since uh, probably since about my 30s I, I remember um, thinking to myself, I'd like to be retired by the age fifty uh, as a as a goal or as a uh, an aspiration. I would probably say at that point because it would, I wouldn't have called it a goal because uh, apart from having a time limit to it, I didn't really have any sort of path to get there. Yeah. Um, so I was diligently piling lots of money into a pension mm. uh, and then getting a pension statement once a year, looking at it feeling slightly depressed, sticking in the bottom drawer and forgetting about it. Um, so that was my, like a lot of people, I think that was my retirement, early retirement strategy. So, uh, so again, I think the, the, the property uh, idea was a, was a way of getting to that, getting to that, that uh, aspiration um, in a more concrete way. Yeah. And also sooner. So, um, you know, it dawned on me that uh, if I was making money through property, I'd be keeping all of it rather than giving money to um, fund managers and other people along the way that you tend to do with pensions and so on. Mm. So my original aim was around about 50. Um, I missed it by three years. And I don't consider that too, too bad a, um, uh, sure, a sure. miss, but I think, having, I think having a goal is critical you know i think that's that's probably which so when did you make that switch from aspiration to clear path as you said um and, yeah yeah so i uh i looked at um moving into the into the property world around about 2010 is when i actually started getting going uh -huh. um but 2008 was when i um started thinking about it seriously and looking at uh, uh, possible ways of doing it. So uh, I started going along to uh, you know, property shows, uh, reading uh, books, as I say, 
Um, I got myself a mentor as well at that stage. Um, so did all the sort of things to prepare. Mm. But at some point I had to uh, make the leap, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a certain amount of uh, fear of the unknown there and um, what might happen. So I think it, to try and help myself in that process, I started uh, quantifying what these, you know, what could go wrong <laughs> under those particular circumstances. You started um, with what could go wrong. <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I started, that, and actually, that that was a good thing because it it um, by quantifying it and making it something real in my mind, then it became less scary in that sense. So um, just things like, you know, what happens if the interest rates go up on a mortgage? Can I still afford to pay it? Mm. And somebody said to me at one point when I was being a little bit overwhelmed by the whole process, I was actually going through the process of buying my first property, buy to let property. Um, a friend of mine just said to me, well, if, if the tenants don't pay, um, bear in mind I was still working full time now, um, would you be able to cover the mortgage? And I said, yeah, I would. He said, well, you haven't really got anything to worry about then, have you? Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. that, that helped. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that context really helped, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you're resisting answering my age question, so I'm not going to push it too much further, but I've worked it out because I'm pretty good at maths, but it must be something around the mid-40s to sort of to late-40s type of thing when you kind of made that that clear path and started in earnest but you don't have to answer that question because clearly um <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to put you on the spot that but that's what it sounds like perhaps um maybe yeah probably yeah probably would be actually yeah 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 okay so i mean it's good to know because um which also means that you're man and boy working um um in in the sort of it industry by the sound of it too so yeah, straight out of college, I went into yeah. IT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it just, it's, it's interesting, you said a few things just there. You may not have even spotted yourself, of course, but, well, I'm sure you did. But um, you talked about, for example, your a pension, and you were putting money into a pension. So I take it you had a, an employer who was also contributing to your pension. Is that right? It wasn't all in your Absolutely, own yeah. And then there was a, this really nice yeah, so- guy, really nice guy called the tax man. Um, he was also contributing as well, wasn't he? I'm assuming it's a he. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So, so that that particular penny dropped um, quite a quite a while before the mm. uh, the property penny dropped, if you like. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, I realised that that was a, a very effective way of saving towards retirement. Mm. And, after all, if you think about it, there's a lot of restrictions around pensions, when you can take them, how you can take them, um, what you can and can't do with them. And somebody would only really subject themselves to all of those different rules and um, you know, potentially uh, uh, have a run-in with Mr. Nice Mr. Taxman unless there was a big benefit of it. And I think that, that benefit of being able to, to save tax is, is, uh, outweighs all of that, really. Yeah, so, so I know it's um to just to jump in. I know it's a big part of your story as well. Um, how this pension plays a part. So I don't want to steal any thunder, but uh, I kind of just I wanted to come back. I wanted just wanted to highlight that point because you talked about leverage, and of course, um, one one way in which we can prepare ourselves. Um, you know, I, I've I've kind of focused on your age a little bit, not to embarrass you, but just to say that effectively you were doing a lot of preparation work, whether you realised it or not. So, for example, putting money into a pension, getting the match contributions from your employer, getting the tax rebate from the tax man, you were already leveraging and building this pot um, of money, which you probably thought you couldn't touch until the grand old age or something, um, and which seems to be getting pushed further and further out anyway. Um, but, you know, so I, I just thought it was an interesting observation at this point, and I know it's probably going to play a part um in in as your story unfolds because of course i know what it is um but that was one point and i think there was um there was another point you made which was you kind of just touched on 
and that's that you sort of got some kind of outside help or support or input in some way you mentioned a mentor i think actually yeah so what what um what was what happened there and why did you decide that was going to be helpful um well i think uh, a lot of it comes down to um I suppose personality type and i'm the kind of person who likes to um uh, to prepare and to do um what's the word investigate if you like before jumping in uh, so i've got to be careful uh, with myself that um i don't end up spending all of my time preparing and not actually doing which is another another thing but uh certainly um i spent a, a decent amount of time um as I say, reading books, and uh, I found that uh, this uh, chap who was recommending to me as a mentor, and um, I mean, I only had something like eight hours of his time, maybe a little bit more, um, and uh, he was based more down in the uh, in the southeast. He'd got properties around uh, the London area and uh, Kent. So, to be fair to him, he probably didn't um, know a lot about the market, which I eventually chose to jump into with both feet um, so um, I mean I, I would say that uh, in, in general it's a good idea to have a mentor but perhaps uh, in his case he didn't really pick up some, some of the potential pitfalls that I ended up um, ended up getting into which is a bit of a shame but I don't really blame him for that I think it was just it was just unfortunate yeah. so but uh, yeah, so in, ter in terms of um, in terms of preparation, yeah, I do, I do like to to, uh, to do a little bit of uh, forensic investigation first. So, and, I, can uh, see, I think I that can does help. The, I can see the little smile on your face, and um, and for anybody who might watch the video version of this, they might see it too. But just just I want to pick up on that because um, you kind of say that in such an understated way. But um, I think one of your because I do know one of your strengths is your you know, forensic ability, as you call it, the, the, the eye on detail and due diligence. And I think, um, you, you know, you certainly have, you know, I talk about going in, in layers of due diligence, um, but you've got another couple of layers on top of mine sometimes. So um, um, I, thought, I thought that was interesting, but maybe, maybe that's more relevant in, in, in as, as we unfold, because um, let's just get the story out then. So you kind of, um, you realize that perhaps you wanted to make a change from single income to, multiple income let's say that or subsid you know, a subsid a subsidized income from property you kind of um got a, a plan or a path to do that um you got a bit of outside help and you've done a bit of self-study um and then what did you decide to do and what what happened you know how did you go about things you've alluded to it but what what, what did you do as a strategy and direction yes well with, yeah well without um going too much into the into the the, the more boring details. I, I went to a property show and there was a chap there who was um, basically selling properties in uh, the Blackpool area, which were multi let And uh, what he was doing was taking, because in that area, obviously, there's a lot of holiday accommodation, and a lot of it was getting converted into permanent. Uh, so he was he was selling those. But um, with my um, uh, perhaps false sense of uh, um, Optimism and bravado. I thought, well, I can do that myself. I can buy a, a rundown holiday flats and um, do that myself. Um, so I wouldn't know what could possibly go wrong. So, uh, so that's <laughs> that's what happened. So I uh, put in an offer on a on a place in Blackpool and uh, purchased it. And uh, I think the uh, the owners. Uh, Basically, couldn't believe their luck that they got this new naive <laughs> property investor from down south and turned up, paid them too much money for this property, and um, taken a big problem off their hands. Uh, so, uh, so there are a number of uh, number of errors along the way, as you can probably tell. Uh, so, uh, I didn't really think about how am I going to manage this property from 250 miles distance. I was living in Oxfordshire at the time. And uh, also, uh, how I was going to find somebody who could manage it. So all of these little minor details kind of passed me by. <laughs> so it was an interesting experience, to say the least. 
it took a little while to get to a point where it was um, making some some money. Um, the other thing was I did a um, classic schoolboy error, which was uh, mixing up profit with cash flow. Mm. Uh, I had to, because it was holiday flat, so uh, don't do this at home, folks. Don't go and buy something commercial and then rent it out as residential if you don't have planning. But uh, that's, that's exactly what I did. Uh, so I had to get a commercial mortgage on it. And the problem with commercial mortgage is that, so it's not a problem, but they tend to be repayment and they tend to be lower loan to value. So um, I was paying quite a lot of money out of the mortgage because I was paying off a chunk of capital. Uh, so uh, the what looked fantastic on a spreadsheet didn't look quite so good in real life with the money actually rolling into the bank, bank account. So a bit of a schoolboy error. Um, and uh, it uh, also proved to be very difficult to find somebody who would reliably manage it for me at that distance. Uh, I think the, uh, the old saying that while the cat's away, the mice will play definitely came into, into uh, the fore at that point. So, but anyway, um, I, got, I got through it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm already starting to sense some battle scars. Um, but, um, so, so Blackpool, um, flat. You know, rental or conversion basically into uh, residential, let them out. And um, I guess it was a sink or swim, swim experience, right? So you got thrown in the deep end a bit there with the, certainly the property and tenant management side of things. Um, and you found your way, you, you didn't sink. <laughs> so what, yes, as, what, as my friend had pointed out, I still had, had enough money to pay the mortgage, so that was okay. <laughs> there you go. So uh, you, you tested that one by the sound of it. <laughs> That's, but um, so what? So what? The, that was the first one in Blackpool, and then kind of how did the things unfold after that? Sort of, kind of just walk us through the, the next stages. Yeah. So um, I bought another one in Blackpool. Must have been a bit of a sucker for punishment. There we go. Um, and um, then it, uh, things went quiet for a couple of years uh, as I was uh, desperately trying to wrestle with these properties and try and get some money out of them. Um, and deal with uh, what would laughingly be described as managers. Um, by the way, in the end, I put a, a letting agent in charge, which uh, probably is something I should have done from the beginning, but that uh, certainly helped help with that problem. Um, uh, I was, but I didn't stop looking around, and uh, I uh, connected with a, uh, an agent in uh, Liverpool area, and. Uh, that was uh, quite a useful situation. They, they, were, um, they were just starting out, they were fairly young and keen, and uh, they also had an um, affiliated company, which was uh, a building and maintenance company. So they'd quite smartly really worked out that they could provide a full package. So as agents in the local area, they knew the area, they had contacts, they were able to source properties. Um, they were able to take fairly run down properties, do the uh, by refurb rent model, and uh, they they would make money on the commission on on, uh, on uh, managing them and letting them out afterwards. So uh, they gently steered me towards uh, student lets, and at the time, certainly Liverpool, it's it's still a huge student city, and at the time there weren't so many purpose built student blocks in the area in the area, and uh, not the whole world hadn't really cottoned on to Liverpool. To, uh, as a cheap uh, capital uh, area, uh, cheap property area, and therefore a high yield area. So um, I basically got, you know, if you like, leverage on leverage because I was able to use these people who would do the do the refurbs. Um, I was able to leverage a low cost area, high yield area, and I was able to do my HMO strategy. So I was getting. Uh, benefits on both sides really so uh, that that worked out a lot better so each property was generating uh, certainly a, you know, a five figure net cash flow every year uh, so I had to put more money in you know I had to buy the properties and spend a lot of money to refer them to a decent standard before I could mortgage them back out again so it was a capital intensive process 
uh, but luckily I'd got enough capital behind me that I could do that. Um, and I was able to leverage somebody else's knowledge mm. uh, and, uh, and their time as well. So, uh, so, mm -hmm. so the, the foray into the student HMO market in Liverpool um, kept you busy for a while, presumably. Um, do you mm. want to show that, any... That read, that, yeah, that, read, that allowed me to hit my, uh, if you like, uh, again, using a bit of a buzzword, that, that financial freedom figure. So I had enough money coming in there. Yeah. Uh, about six about, of them. About six of those, yeah. Yeah, over the course of about two or three years, I bought six of them. Mm. And, and it's also relevant to, so you, got, you were getting sort of, as you say, five digit annual uh, net cash flow um, on around about six of them. We kind of do the maths there. Um, <clears throat> and that allowed you to hit your, your, the, your target number, which allowed you this flexibility to decide what to do. But just before we get, you know, maybe go to the next step, you said you had a bit of capital behind you. So um, how did you fund, um, you know, how did you find the capital to do, I presume you didn't rob a bank. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, you've just given my strategy away. Um, <laughs> you can see a balaclava behind you, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So, Some Sicilian associates I've got. Um, no, so so I was uh, I, I had some I had some savings as well, so I had enough. Um, you know, these properties again, they, they were relatively cheap, so uh, you can buy them for around about fifty thousand. You could spend anywhere from about thirty to fifty thousand doing them up, and um, I'd, I'd like to think that actually I, I was one of the first people to think of doing this in the, in, the, in this area um, because the uh, the agent stroke builder that I was working with uh, did look at me a little bit strangely when I first suggested it. But they, they we're talking about little mid terraced Victorian houses here, and. Um, basically gutted the first floor completely back to brick well all of it back to brick um, and rebuilt the first floor to fit in three double bedrooms and a bathroom because you know, students don't tend to mind so much sharing bathrooms you didn't need to have all on suites um, so there were two receptions downstairs so one of those could become a bedroom so then that could get you to four bedrooms and then I said well why don't we just go in the loft what would it cost so probably added about another 10,000 to the refer costs to do that um, and uh, you could even fit an ensuite up there as well so uh, by maximizing the, the space uh, or optimizing the space you managing to uh, maximize the income as well because the bottom the, the expenses didn't change much but the top line went up by 20 25 percent so that basically fell straight through to the bottom line mm -hmm. so by renting it, in other words, renting out an extra bedroom, that was pure profit, really. So, um, other people sort of took that idea and then extended it to the max. I think probably going to bid overboard all around that area and started putting in um, two bedrooms in the loft. So they were getting up to six bedroom HMOs. I think that, to be fair, I think that was pushing it a little bit, you know, a little, a little terraced house. So, I always tried to go for a minimum room size of. Um, three meter by three meter so that they were double rooms and also with an eye to the future then I would be able to get back to renting it out as a very good quality single let or selling it as a good quality family house at any point in the future if I needed to so that's an important that's distinction actually that you're not um, you're not squeezing the juice out of the lemon too much and that you've also because um, by the way students will need desk space won't they as well so exactly so they as well as the bed um, <clears throat> and it's single occupancy but with a, a larger bed presumably exactly yeah yeah but um, exactly. and I think the other thing you've you kind of highlight is that you, you you had one eye on it being used in an alternative way to give you an, an alternative exit essentially exactly yeah that's right I think that's that's one lesson um, that anybody should take away from this is you need to have you know a plan b and preferably a plan c and a plan d if you can because um especially with what's going on at the moment you know nobody expected any of this uh, uh coronavirus and all the rest of it was going on you need to be able to be flexible 
absolutely. Mm. And uh, you know, the more options that you give yourself, the better. Okay, so, so, yeah. And so you had, you've got, you had the Blackpool experience, you moved to Liverpool and then kind of, is there a, I know there's more in your story, so just get it all out there and let's just share. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so that, that got me to the point where I, you know, I could have left my job if I wanted to, uh, but I chose not to, uh, carried on working. Um, and um, actually it's an interesting thing, I've got, uh, I once heard somebody talk about you know, what the definition of wealth is, and if you ask most people, um, it'll involve money somewhere along the line. But to me, I think um, the real definition of wealth is um, time freedom, because um, you know you can. There's no real limit on how much money you can make, um, with some caveats. You, know, you have to work hard. You have to. Um, know the right people you have to have some capital up front isn't it? you know I'm not saying anybody can make a unlimited amount of money but you know in the right circumstances and the right person they can however um, they've still got the same number of hours in the day so it's how you use that time um, but also it's uh, giving yourself time freedom I think is a real um, measure of wealth and being able to decide what you want to do with that time and that's really what it gave me. And in a way, it became a lot easier to go into work every day, knowing that I didn't have to go there. You know, because it became optional. It kind of didn't matter that much. Um, so every time, went, every time you went past the vision statements, the value statements, <laughs> the, what was the word? Authenticity? Was it authenticity? <laughs> authenticity. Yeah, you, you kind of had it like you put on oh, now. But <laughs> smile on your face, presumably. Yes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Rather than a grimace, it was a more of a smile at that stage. So, uh, so it brought, yeah. it brought you a piece of peace of mind. Um, yes. You know, if if they'd have said tata, or or you'd have wanted to say tata, you could have done. Exactly, that's right. And I think that that uh, puts you in an immensely powerful position, really. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, another thing that, that talking about how I got into thinking about an alternative to to working um, there was a there was a redundancy program announced not long after I started in my property journey while I was still basically struggling with, with Blackpool properties uh, probably around about 2010 something like that and um, as it happened I was I was fine I didn't get didn't get selected but uh, this would be post the, uh, the 28 2008 2009 uh, downturn but being a North American company, um, they, they are quite sort of higher and fire. Um, and they don't tend to think an awful lot about long term future and having to retrain people and find people with those skill sets in the future. So, uh, you know, the, uh, if the bottom line is suffering, then they'll, the first thing they'll tend to do is, is uh, take people out. So, uh, Brexit worked really well for me in that, in that sense because it, when it got to 2016, and um, the uh, consultancy, uh, the IT consultancy pipeline dried up a bit. They uh, announced another redundancy program. And because I was in the position where I could um, not have to worry too much, um, I'd already intimated to one or two people um, that um, you know, should there ever be any uh, possible requirement to slim down the organisation in the future, um, I wouldn't necessarily be uh, too devastated um, if they wanted, a, <laughs> if they wanted to, <laughs> to let you, me go. You were very subtle, but so you didn't go around photocopying your backside then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> only at weekends. But, okay. uh, no, but most of, most of the time it was fine. So um, no, no, it was it was uh, that was that was all it took really. And then you got, you got you know, to remember these you. things. Basically. I got the real yeah. Yeah, got the real and it was all pretty amicable, really. So, yeah. uh, so I walked away into the uh, uh, into the sunset um, about two years ago. So, uh, just over two years ago, and uh, so that worked out worked out fine. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I would I wouldn't uh, necessarily suggest that you know as soon as you've got you think you've got enough money in the bank that you uh, don't need to work again that you. Um, basically go in and tell your boss exactly what you think of them and um, taking a small picture of 
bridge and set fire to it and walk out the door. Um, I don't think that's necessarily. Yeah. You're fired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah. In fact, they they did say, um, you know, if we do get another project along, can we can we call you? Right. <laughs> Let's, let's just pause on that thought, though, because a lot of people actually have the idea, and it'd be interesting your take on this. In fact, you've kind of just said, but I'd like to understand the rationale behind the thought process. Um, but once you get your financial freedom number or whatever it is, you know, your, the income replacement number, you, 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 know, you said you didn't leave immediately, and then you just said it's not necessarily the right thing to do to leave at that point in time. Why is that? Um, well, there were a couple of there were a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about um, diversified income streams. But uh, there's another income stream right there. Why would you cut it off? Mm. Why would you cut off your nose to spite your face? Really, mm. um, somebody's daft enough to keep paying me for not doing very much. I mean, for for uh, being a highly um, valued member of the team, then why why would I, uh, you know, refuse? Really, so it would have been rude to. <laughs> Don't uh, don't look the gift horse in the mouth, yeah. Okay. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, so so there was that, uh, and you know certainly my intention at the time was to continue to increase portfolio, and uh, as I say, perhaps we we'll talk a bit more about diversification, but to um, if you like to to shore up my position uh, to make sure that I uh, that I was. Yeah. really in a, in a comfortable position financially so. okay so um and then just to kind of um uh, to kind of move on to some maybe some lessons and stuff like that just to kind of conclude so you at this point you've you're redundant you presumably got a, a wad of cash burning a hole in your back pocket yeah okay uh which will fuel the the, the additional growth that you just alluded to um was there more than liverpool hmos Think there is? Yeah, yeah. So um, again, talking about diversifying, uh, I, I thought to myself, well, I've, I've got, uh, you know, Blackpool is kind of just sitting there in the background at the time and not really doing a lot. Uh, most of my income was coming from Liverpool HMOs. So I just thought to myself, well, I don't really want to have all of my eggs in one Scouse studenty basket, if you like. <laughs> so, um, I thought I'd better do something diversify, perhaps geographically diversify tenant type, diversify strategy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, all of those things. So I, uh, I started uh, um, buying HMOs or refurbing houses into HMOs around the, uh, the Greater Manchester area, same side, Nolden mainly. Um, so we've got three of those now. And uh, they're generating a nice income. Just to clarify, so sorry. sorry, Ian, they're, uh, they're not student HMOs, are they? That's right, yeah, they're professionals. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so again, different, different tenant type, uh, different geography. Um, and uh, so there's still HMO strategy. So then latterly, um, I've... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've moved up to sunny Lan Lancashire and uh, I've got some properties uh, probably less than five miles away from where I live now, um, which are single lets, they're flats. Uh, so they're obviously a lot lower maintenance than HMOs, uh, but lower returns as well. Uh, but they do have uh, yeah, a lot more, if you like, stability, less, less tenant turnover kind of thing uh, they're not that far from the hospital so as you can imagine at the moment they're uh, no problem messing them out so, mm. uh, so that, that's that's proved to be a good, good move as well and uh, yeah so the other area that having uh, reached the um, go on I'll put it right out there the magic age of 55 last year uh, <laughs> um, that allowed me to access I did I guilt you into that I'm sorry if I did <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't. I don't look. I don't look old enough. I know that. So, um, as people often tell me. So, but um, that 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 uh, that allowed me access to my uh, to my to my pension. Uh, but also, um, I discovered the, uh, uh, the power of SAS pension. So I was able to um, uh, ac 
access that money and lend it out to third parties so that I was able to uh, use that as another income stream. So uh, interest on uh, development loans, essentially. So that's immediately given me a, a very broad base of uh, different income streams right there. So it gives me a lot more uh, you know, comfort, if you like. That, uh, helping even if one to, goes helping to sell the shovels in the gold rush uh, yeah exactly yeah, exactly. yeah. so uh, this is an interesting point actually i wanted to kind of bring this i was hoping you get to this point uh so you you talk about sas small smell uh, smell small self-administered <laughs> pension scheme obviously yeah um, now yeah. there's probably a few people who don't really know what that is um <laughs> But and, and I know you know it pretty well. So why don't you just just give us a quick uh, overview of that? Yeah. So uh, it's a basically a company pension scheme, uh, which is I think it can have a maximum of about twenty members. So normally it's used by small companies uh, for their directors, and uh, it's an occupational pension scheme. So it differs to something like a SIP, which is a personal pension, which is for an individual. Um, because I've got a company, uh, investment company, which is, owns, the, uh, owns the properties, uh, and I'm the director, uh, I can basically set one of these up. Uh, and it has a lot more flexibility because uh, a lot more control over the pension funds than you would get with a personal pension, for example. So it allows you to do some uh, unusual things like you can lend money to your uh, sponsoring company. So my, uh, my investment company can borrow money from my pension and use that to invest in property or lend out or whatever you want to do with it. Uh, pretty much within, scheme, within HMRC rules, obviously. Uh, but because it's a loan, um, there's not really that many restrictions and the other thing that you can do is you're free to invest it pretty much how you like so uh, again as long as you're uh, prudent it's on a commercial basis and it's secure and those three rules that HMRC uh, put against it because uh, you know if you were to lose all of your money then um, HMRC wouldn't make as, as much tax so obviously they're quite concerned uh, but yeah <laughs> that you don't uh, fritter it away so uh so that's uh that, that also gives you a lot of flexibility so you can invest it in the stock market you can invest it in uh, bonds you can invest it in uh, other developers and so that immediately allows you to to loan money out you, know, you can secure those those uh, those funds mm -hmm. just as a bank would uh, with a charge yeah. Uh, first charge and so on. So um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a uh, strange feeling. I didn't think when I started out ten years ago that I would sort of become a bank. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a bit. It's interesting seeing it from the other side of the coin. I suppose. You see, what what a, a, a lot of people who go full time in property don't expect to be a bank and they don't expect to be a, a letting agent. Um, you know, they're, they're <laughs> often you know what happens. So, uh, you know, yes. you know yes, this, exactly this sort of. I mean, I know in your case you're still outsourcing a lot of the uh, lettings and property management, um, uh, but I know you also have a bit of a watching brief over them. But I won't I won't go into that too much because, uh, but because uh, of the interest of time. But um, I think what. Um, just, just, and I really wanted to just get back that whole, you know, pension thing. So, just go wind back to you said you were squirreling away money into your company pension, which was then being matched to some degree or all of it, you know, by your employer, which was then being topped up by the tax man. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to however long that was, to then transferring that out and into your own company-controlled so uh, SaaS which you're then using to fund your future property uh, investments yourself and indeed to also, you know, provide loans, as you say, to, to other developers to provide an additional income stream. So I just really wanted to join those dots. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you've, it's not. Yeah. So, yeah. So I mean, that, that's a, that was a, 
you know, if, if there was an aha moment, it's probably somebody saying to me, um, why don't you get one of these SaaS thingies? And then looking into it and realizing the, the, the power of it. Um, but certainly when you look at uh, using other people's money, it's, it, it, is, it is an incredibly powerful tool. As you say, um, when I was putting money into my pension way back, way back when, um, you know, I was a 40% taxpayer, so I was, uh, the taxman was basically subsidising that 40% back. My employer was matching, and uh, the, the, you save even more money because uh, if your comp- if your employer is reasonably switched on, then they'll do it through a salary sacrifice, which means that uh, effectively you're not paying national insurance. Uh, on that money either and neither is your employer so when you look at it it's something like about a 50 percent tax saving when you add it all up plus what your employer's throwing into the pot and most retirees are basic rate taxpayers so you only ever pay tax on that money at 20 percent and there's no national insurance to worry about and uh, you can take a quarter of it um, as a tax-free lump sum anyway so it's a it's, it's a no-brainer, really. In terms of the the, the control, so the um, yeah, so those those funds you can lend as like fifty percent of your pension pot back to your company. Um, you have to do it over a maximum of five years capital and interest. So it's a big chunk of money to pay back. So uh, you need to have the cash flow to do it, which is where the HMOs come in. Um, you know, they can they can fund those uh, those repayments. Uh, but once you get over the, the 55 year old threshold, then you can access a quarter of your money tax free anyway. So you could even use that to start to pay back some of these loan backs if you need to. So yeah. there's ways and means around it. But just to hold that thought though, because you said you can, because you know you're not you're not 55 yet. Um, so you you can access yeah. you said you can access 25 percent of it tax free personally when you hit 25 uh, 25 55. Um, which is obviously a lot before the, the, the retirement age, the, the state retirement age. I forgot what it is now. What is it these days? 67 now. This, this 67. Yeah. Yeah. So that's already 12 years in advance of the national or the state retirement age for state pension. Um, that's 12 years in advance. But in, interestingly, you were utilizing the funds in your SAS before then, weren't you? So mm-hmm. you can actually yes. utilize the funds well in advance at age 55 as well which obviously you were doing so here's my conclusion absolutely yeah well not my conclusion my observation is um and i don't know what you think about this you know i know you don't like the buzzwords but essentially you 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 were your own bank weren't you so um you you were sort of and then creating these deposits which i've just done some quick maths and you were multiplying your let's say it was 10,000 a year. I'm not, I don't know what it was, but let's say it was 10,000 a year you're putting into your pension. Um, matched by your employer, another 10,000. 40, uh, no, so 4,000. Taxman tops up because he tops up your contribution. That's 24,000 on every 10,000. Obviously, you, whatever you put in. Uh, it didn't really matter what the performance was, did it? I mean, I know no. you, were, you were upset and you put your statement in the drawer and stuff like that, but... If you, th- if you actually clocked how much you put in versus what the fund value was, unless you invested into some, some fruity areas or something, you know, it was probably a lot more than the total contributions that you personally made, I imagine. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, uh, yeah, I, I think there have been uh, yeah, suggestions mooted that, that, that the, uh, the generosity of the, uh, of the tax regime around pensions might well change in future. But I would definitely say to anybody who's got the opportunity to take an, uh, an employer's pension, grab it with both hands, you know, you need to make hay while that particular sun is shining. Then yeah. It'll be there forever. Maybe so. So um, I just wanted to get that point, maybe being your own bank, but equally, I think another uh, success principle is the point of um, delaying your gratification. So, you know, you were patient here, weren't you? You, you squirreled away money into your pension. Um, you said that you'd, even when you took loan backs from your SAS, that you had to repay that over five years. So effectively, you're deferring certainly cash flow uh, from, your, from the investments that you were utilizing. If I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I don't know about the details, but in principle, yeah. you, you, you had to repay it over five years before you really had free cash flow without that 
uh, repayment thing. So there was a lot of this delayed gratification that you were practicing. But mm -hmm. just, just paint the picture, you know, of, of what your life is like today. I, I know that, you know, you're kind of a private person. I don't need to go into too much detail. But, you know, how, do, how does life look for you these days? You know, you yeah, well, I mean, I mean I'm, mean, uh, uh, you know, as I say, I, I was living in a probably a fairly expensive part of the country and I've moved uh, a bit further up the M6. So that's, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a very lucky position that I've been able to buy uh, the house that I've got uh, outright. So I don't have any uh, personal mortgage to worry about. I've got a lot of buy to let mortgages, but that's a different story. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of the house that I've got, it's, 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 uh, it's bigger, it's in a lovely part of the country. So it's allowed me to do all of those things. Uh, but as you say, uh, you know, it's not something that uh, I've jumped into doing. I did it when I had, the funds available and also being a you know selling a, a smaller house in a more expensive part of the country allowed me to uh, have some change left over as well so it, it's it's certainly it's certainly worth uh, thinking about thinking long term rather than thinking about uh, you know, uh, getting the latest you know, the newest car or whatever as soon as you start making a bit of money so i'm still driving you know people uh, I think it's funny. I'm still driving around the 15-year-old Toyota. <laughs> just about uh, gets off the driveway under, under its own steam. So uh, a number mm -hmm. of people have uh, <laughs> commented that I don't look like a, a millionaire property investor when I turn up outside. Well, I, I was. Do you know the thought that was going through my mind there was the uh, the millionaire next door? Are you, are you, have you read that uh, that particular book? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a really good book. Yeah. yeah. And um, and what do you do with your time, Ian? Uh, so, pretty much what I like, which is the great, <laughs> probably the, the, the biggest payoff that, I, the, that I've got, really. So, uh, you know, even if I was still sitting in the in my little house in Oxfordshire, I probably wouldn't have worried too much. But uh, yeah, I don't have to. Um, you know, what, one of my uh, objectives for leaving my job was, uh, you know, making sure that I never have to work for another idiot again and um, also you know hope he's not listening or she's not listening <laughs> <laughs> no names no pack drill <laughs> um, and also you know no matter what happens you know I can do what I want when I want without having to worry about how to pay for it really so I don't have to worry about losing my job I don't have to worry about getting sick so uh, you know, we can uh, probably make people <laughs> jealous just saying it but you know, I, can, I can drive five minutes down the road and can be at the beach but uh, if it makes them feel any better it is more than bay so uh, it's, not all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not all yeah it's not all it did look very very nice yesterday i have to say in the, in the uh, sunshine yeah. but I, I also know you're you're uh, um i don't embarrass you but i know you're sort of a, you, you're a modest man you drive you just said you drive a 15 year old car for example and um would you say you, you live a champagne and caviar lifestyle? <laughs> yeah, well, somebody said to me once, um, you're more of a, a beer and a pie man, which um, I think that, uh, I'm not quite sure what made him say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't possibly think. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's probably right. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have lavish tastes, which probably but, helps. But I know that you've uh, got... But I, I, do, I, I do have, uh, you know, I do enjoy doing uh, certain things. I like making my own beer, for example. And uh, I spent most of Monday brewing a batch of beer, for example. So uh, with all these pubs closed at the moment, you've got to do what you, what you can, haven't you? Really? Well, absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it, tasting some at some point. Um, that'd be good. But I also know that you managed to get away now and again. Indeed, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, my... Uh, this is, uh, is from Australia, I'm brought up in Australia, so we try and get over there every year uh, to go and see her dad. Uh, unfortunately, the circumstances have intervened uh, this year, so uh, I think uh, it's going to be difficult to fly anywhere. But, mm -hmm. um, otherwise, yes, we like to get out, I like to, you know, have, have quite a few holidays in the UK as well. So uh, that's, uh, uh, again, I enjoy that. So. Mm -hmm. 
cool. lots of places to explore around here too. Excellent. So, uh, and maybe just starting to think about, you know, um, towards wrapping, um, there's maybe a couple of points I just want to get out from you. Um, and if there's anything that you want to share as well, obviously, but I think it's, you know, what have you learned along the way? You know, because, you know, was it all plain sailing? Have you had any ups and downs? Have you changed, changed your mind or direction about certain things along the way? Um, so those sort of things. And then I guess equally, have you got any sort of tips or advice or suggestions for anyone listening to this who might want to follow a similar sort of path? Those sort of key wrap up type questions, I suppose. Yeah. So uh, as, I, as I sort of alluded to before, I think, uh, Diversifying your income streams is uh, is key. Uh, certainly, uh, when I started out, I didn't uh, uh, realise how much work was involved with HMOs, so uh, might not necessarily have been my first choice uh, with hindsight. Um, certainly, when the uh, the tax changes came in, uh, that, that uh, threw a bit of a spanner in the works. Uh, as I owned all of my Liverpool properties in my own name, so uh, I had to scramble to put all of those inside my limited company before the uh, introduction of the extra 3% stamp duty came in. So uh, I was one of that uh, massive peak of transactions that happened before, <laughs> before that came in. Uh, so uh, again, it's probably uh, you know, cliche, but that's pivoting really. I think you have to be pretty agile uh, as a as a an investor as an as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to look at what's happening around you. And at the moment, there's a lot going on. Uh, there's, there's all of the regulatory changes that are coming in. There's the tax changes. Uh, there's coronavirus. So you need to be able to, uh, as I say, think think of multiple exits and also think of how you can potentially use those to your advantage. I think again, there's that sort of mindset changes that. Uh, you know, talk about different threats, but you can also look at them as opportunities. And I think what an entrepreneur does really is spot opportunities where other people don't. You know, sort of all of those things a lot of people see as problems, uh, you know, tax, regulation, coronavirus, <laughs> whatever. But uh, that's making the market uh, possibly less competitive because fewer people are going to want to get involved in all of that. And a lot of landlords who are doing it might be getting tired and fed up and wanting to move out of the market. So there could be buying opportunities there, there could be less competition. And I think potentially the, uh, uh, the, the letting industry will become a lot more professionalised as time goes on. I think that's part of what the governments are trying to achieve uh, by introducing regulations and so on. I think it gets to the point pretty soon where people are going to be pushed into using betting agents unless they really know what they're doing um, and have systems and processes in place that a letting agent would have in order to be able to manage a property professionally. How many amateur landlords are out, out there that you know, don't even have gas safety certificates and things like that, basic stuff, which we all know about but uh, a surprisingly large number of people don't. It's really quite scary when you think about it. So you can understand why, uh, you know, why they want to professionalise the industry. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah. Um, was, uh, um, is there anything you would do differently? Um, that's, that's a difficult one to say, really, because I think hindsight's a wonderful thing, but completely useless obviously um so it's uh well, it's useless yes, to, if, if I, it's useless to you <laughs> but maybe of benefit to someone who's listening to this yes exactly yeah exactly uh so if you yeah, if i was to wind the, you know if i didn't have the 10 years of experience that i've got now would i have done anything differently 10 years ago uh possibly i would have taken perhaps slightly smaller steps rather than jumping in to uh, a pretty complex uh, investment type and done trying to do it at arm's length. Um, I'd have perhaps picked something within an hour or so of where I live, or lived at the time, um, perhaps gone for a single let, learned the ropes that way. Um, and I think the other thing that I didn't really have a lot of was, was a network of people around me. I didn't have um, 
professionals who were really experts in the particular uh, industry, you know, letting industry. There's a lot of, for example, solicitors out there who are perfectly good conveyancing solicitors, but they don't understand letting, same with, with mortgage brokers, for example. Um, so I think getting a, a, a good team of people around you, that's pretty critical as well. So, um, and yeah, as I say, I think also networking. Yeah. So maybe just a couple of quick final ones just to finish off. Um, so I don't think too much about it, but two, two, two questions. One is, um, I know you like your apps and your resources and your kind of little tech and tools. So I'm going to ask you to think about your just, just one really cool app or piece of tech or tool that you, you like. And whilst you're thinking about it, the second thing I'm going to ask you about is what's your favorite book? So there you go. I've just put two ideas in your head at the same time there. But so come on then, what would be your favorite uh, or, or top tip for an app or a hack or a resource? And then what's your favorite book? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll go, I'll go the other way around because uh, the first <laughs> thing that popped into my head was the book. <laughs> so um, I'm going to say uh, an author rather than a book, which is Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And I find his books, uh, so he's, uh, he's written a couple of books, Black Swan being one, Fooled by Randomness. And I, lo I love the way that he thinks about, um, if you like, probabilities and chance and that sort of thing in a completely different way to how most people do. And uh, I think that's sort of survivorship bias of, uh, that you know, we hear about all the successful people and they all did it by having some magic source, um, how much of it was actually at random and perhaps there's one thing I haven't talked about much on this but you know how much how much did luck play in my uh, in my story uh, probably not an insignificant amount um, I've probably lucked out in, in a few ways so uh, yeah. that's uh, that's one thing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, apps probably be really boring and say something like Outlook because um, I can do things like um, you know schedule reminders with Outlook and rather you know, not just meetings and so on, but uh, it uh, it's quite good. It's quite good at uh, nagging me to do things because I can set up a reminder. It pops up. I'll say I'll do that in an hour, and it pops up again an hour later. So uh, things things tend to get done quite well that way. So in terms of walking around, I'll go for I'll go for another app while I'm talking about Ever, Evernote's quite good as well for, for uh, capturing uh, information on the go and thoughts and so on. Oh, I mean, I was, I was really interested two for the price of one. Absolutely. I was interested in the psychology of some of that because you're saying this sort of contrarian thinking with Nicholas Taylor, but I agree with you, some of his books are um, very good, actually. Um, and then you talk about this constant nagging that you give yourself with uh, Outlook. So I'm just trying to put those two things together and work out what that mean, what that tells me about you. But I don't think it tells me anything. I just think it's, uh, it's just really interesting. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, but um, before we close, but I shall give you the opportunity to do that if you did. Um, no, not really. Well, just just on on that on that uh, theme of uh, of nagging, you know, uh, there's reading an interesting book at the moment, which is talking about um, about habits and uh, motivation, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's interesting um, model that this chap uses. He talks about um, behaviour is driven by uh, motivation and ability, and the thing that actually makes you do it is a prompt. So if something's really easy to do, you'll do it. Um, if you're really motivated to do something, you'll do it. A lot of people focus on the motivation. They think about, you know, I have to uh, be really disciplined with my day. I have to do everything. But they kind of um, are giving themselves a lot more work than they necessarily have to. They might think about ability. And maybe if they want to introduce a new uh, habit into their lives, they should maybe think about starting small and starting easy and giving themselves a prompt so you know, even if it's as simple as a google very nice sounds good google, uh, uh, an outlook reminder sorry getting another one in there now so uh, <laughs> what was what was the name of that book then come on we'll have some two for the price of one there then what's that book you're referring to um oh go on um this one um well, there's two there's two good books out there about habits one's called atomic habits i knew you were going to say that <laughs> I know, so I'm, I know you're resisting. And uh, the other one's called Tiny Habits. It's by a guy called Tiny Habits, by a guy called BJ Fogg. 
Uh, and, uh, that's also a really good book. It's a short book, easy to read, and um, a little exercise at the end of the chapter. So, yeah, it's, you know, uh, it's designed you know by it's design, like you, can, you, know <laughs> you can tell it's designed by a behavioural scientist. Yeah. So, um, Atomic Habits is a bit of an in joke between us, I know. Um, but maybe I think it's, it's probably an opportunity to, uh, on that note, as you reminded me about Atomic Habits, is to bring the conversation to a close. Um, I just wanted to thank you for joining us. You're the first victim, as I mentioned, on this, uh, on this, this series. Uh, we've talked to quite a lot, actually. Um, but I think there's an, there's an awful lot of valuable content here. And um, I think, you know, you're, you've done it a certain way. And what I wanted to do over this, this series is share um, different ways that people have achieved this or are looking to achieve this, you know, go full time in property or get freedom or whatever you want to call it. So thanks so much for sharing your way, your, your story. I really appreciate that. And um, well, yeah, it's been great to, to hear and, you know, it was useful. <laughs> no, no, it's very, very useful. Thanks so much. Appreciate it so much, but probably in the interest of time, we'll say bye for now. And uh, thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Ian. It's been great. Thank you, Richard.